Welcome everyone. My name is Terry Ross and I'm the director of the Hunter Center for Entrepreneurship and Innovation. On behalf of the Haskins School of Business and the School of Public Policy, I warmly welcome you all to the first of an exciting two-part discussion on barriers and benefits to entrepreneurial thinking in government. The Haskins School of Business is pleased to partner on this event with the School of Public Policy. We believe it's valuable to facilitate strategic conversations between business leaders, students, faculty, and practitioners. Welcome to you all. I'd like to begin with the territorial acknowledgement. The University of Calgary gratefully acknowledges that this event is not only being held in cyberspace, but also in the traditional territories of the people of the Treaty 7 region in Southern Alberta, which includes the Blackfoot Confederacy, the Tsutsina First Nation, and the Stony Nakoda. The City of Calgary is also home to the Métis Nation of Alberta, Region 3. Thank you all for joining us today. We're very pleased to welcome Dr. Mariana Mazzucato, in the Professor in the Economics of Innovation and Public Value at University College London, where she is the founding director of the Institute for Innovation and Public Pur Purpose, the IIPP. The IIPP's work is about effective mission-oriented policy and how it can meet a society's needs. The IIPP explores entrepreneurial and challenging ideas such as public and private actors co-creating markets, welcoming uncertainty, and strategically tilting economic activity. And while we engage with challenging ideas like these that can guide our socioeconomic future, I urge Albertans and Canadians to find inspiration from our past, such as Peter Lougheed, entrepreneurially enacting forward thinking, mission oriented policies like AOSTRA, Heritage Fund, the Heritage Foundation for Medical Research, and the Underground Test Facility to catalyze Alberta and Canada's economy. I like to think that Peter Lougheed and Mariana Mazzucato would have got along quite well. At the end of the Professor Mazzucato's presentation, we'll move to a question and answer period moderated by Dr. Dan Wicklum of the Transition Accelerator, a new pan-Canadian charitable organization whose mandate is to understand disruptions and then strategically accelerate economic transitions. The Transition Accelerator recently released a thought-provoking report titled Towards Net Zero, a key role for hydrogen, which I warmly recommend. Please submit your succinct questions using the question and answer function in Zoom and consider upvoting any questions that you like. Now, before I welcome Professor Mazzucato onto your screens, we would like to engage you in a quick poll now and again at the end of, the, of today's event. So please answer on a scale of one to five, where five means strongly agree. I am comfortable with a competent government being an active risk taker in the pursuit of economic growth, even when initiatives fail sometimes. Give me a couple minutes to answer that. And now it is my great pleasure to welcome Professor Mariana Mazzucato. Mariana? Thank you so much. Um, I hope you can all hear me well. It's, it's a real honor to be addressing you. It's only too bad I'm not there physically. Um, what I would like to do is precisely to approach the question that was just asked, which is what happens when governments actually step outside of their comfort zone? And instead of just kind of focusing on the horizontal conditions, the rules of the game, uh, actually dare to invest, dare to co-create markets and not only fix them. Um, I'm now gonna share my screen. I just wanna do this carefully so I don't share any family photos along the way. <laughs> um, here we go, let me put this on large, there we go. So I wanna begin the presentation, there we go. I hope you can see this properly, with, with really the title, which is that you know this is actually about this discussion is about steering an economy in a particular direction. There's so much talk about you know, sustainable growth, innovation-led growth, and inclusive growth. What does it actually mean for what has to happen on the ground? Do we have the tools for it? Do we have the partnerships for it? Um, and I will basically be arguing that we don't, but there's a lot of interesting things from our history in capitalism. When I say our, I think of humanity, the things we've achieved. Um, whether it was going to the moon and back again in one generation, the, the uh, objective set by Kennedy and achieved exactly 50 years ago, uh, or even just setting up welfare states like Beveridge did in the UK, and today really thinking concretely about what does it mean to not only address, but find a pathway towards uh, actually solving or coming closer to solving the 17 sustainable development goals that countries have um, set themselves. Um, and you know, this, this first slide here just looks at different ways in which this directionality is being talked about globally. 
before COVID, we're all so wrapped up now with the health pandemic, but you'll remember that in the autumn last year, there was so much talk in many different countries, in the US and Canada and Europe, all over the globe, in the African countries about the need for a green new deal of course, um, you know, building on the concept of the New Deal of Roosevelt, but much more steered towards a green transition. There's been talk in Europe now for a decade or more about the need to direct the economy towards a particular type of growth, smart, inclusive, sustainable, especially but not only since the financial crisis, because we should all remember there was no lack of growth before the financial crisis. It was just a very problematic form of growth. It was a very financialized form of growth. I'm sitting today in the UK where we still have a financialized form of growth. Uh, if you break down GDP into its four components of demand, consumption, business investment, government investment, and net exports, the country, again, that I'm sitting in right now tends to grow more through debt-fueled consumption. So it's not investment-led and it's not innovation-led. And so what does it mean to transition from a debt-fueled consumption-led growth to an investment-led growth with that investment actually directed at solving big societal challenges? Big question. Um, and these SDGs, we should remember, are, are you know, really bold. You know, some people say it's a shopping list, but first of all, they have 169 targets beneath them. And also, they've been signed up to by you know, over 200 countries around the world. So, What's the point of signing up to something if then you don't have a strategy of how to get there? Um, and another really important thing, this is all sort of the context in which um, I'm speaking here, is that industrial strategy itself has come back in many different countries after basically being a blasphemy. Um, I had an interesting conversation yesterday with both Democrats and Republicans in the US and the United States about industrial strategy and how it's been interpreted uh, in the US in the United States. And I wrote a book called The Entrepreneurial State, which basically argued that the United States has always had an industrial strategy. It just doesn't talk about it. It acts Hamilton and it uh, uh, talks Jefferson. Hamilton, everyone knows about him now because of the musical, but he was of course a politician in the US that actually advocated a much more heavy kind of visible hand of the government. The, the problem is if you don't, if you, you know, act in one way and talk in another, there also isn't sort of learning within the country about the lessons along the way. Because uh, a lot of these things, whether it's the Green Deal, achieving innovation-led growth, tackling the SDGs, uh, you know, uh, actually having an industrial strategy, it's always gonna be a messy process. There'll always be huge room for learning, trial and error and error and error. But if we don't actually have a way to explicitly talk about directionality and steering an economy in a particular direction, and learning the mistakes along the way, then it's, 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 it's a lost opportunity even when those uh, uh, strategies are being implemented. And so again, the reason I wrote The Entrepreneurial State back in 2013 was that I thought that we needed to better understand the role of public policy as going beyond just fixing things when they go wrong. That if we actually wanted to confront the issues of uh, a green deal, innovation-led growth, we actually also had to understand what occurred in the past when the state actually was able to act uh, in a more ambitious way and foster in partnership with the private sector some massive changes, um, whether it was big technological changes or also big social and um, in some ways organizational innovations. But this idea again that the state is there simply to fix a market failure and then get out of the way is, is extremely strong in economic theory. And economic theory isn't just abstract philosophy, it informs policymaking. Uh, Keynes had a wonderful quote. He said that practitioners, sorry, John Maynard Keynes, the famous uh, economist who talked about the role of the state, he said that practitioners on the ground who you know, think they're sort of devoid of theory and they're just getting the job done, getting Brexit done, getting a green transition done, are actually slaves of, of defunct economic theory. So in some ways kind of revealing the way that siloed and static economic theory has been informing policymaking, I think is very important 
even before we think about better policies or it should happen at the same time. So this idea that again, the state, yes, it's important, but it's really just there to patch things up when they go wrong, whether it's because you have a negative externality, so pollution, state comes in and brings in a carbon tax, needed, but again, a patch, um, comes in and fixes the lack of investment in a particular area because of the public good and positive externality feature, so invests in basic, say, research and development. All these areas exist, these market failures exist, but really, my point has been that it, it would be very hard to understand the history of government investment, especially when it was successful, if we just thought about it in terms of, of, of fixing. So in fact, all the, all the uh, technology that makes this iPhone, which is counting down my time here, um, smart and not stupid, actually came from active government strategic investments, which came from thinking about directions whether it was technological directions or something else, but they were also often problem-based. So the internet, Siri, GPS, touchscreen display were all spillovers of government actually doing more than just horizontal conditions or fixing market failures. The internet, uh, just as an example, came about when government had, you know, posed itself a problem, wanted to get the satellites to uh, communicate, and the internet was a solution to that. Similarly, GPS was the solution to much more uh, precision uh, that was needed by the military and so on. But what's interesting, if you look at this uh, you know, uh, figure that I had put in that uh, first book that I wrote, or popular book, I'd written academic books, which no one reads, but this book that was written for normal people, uh, you know, this wasn't just public money thrown from you know, helicopters. This actually came from particular types of public organizations. And so one of the interesting things is that when we confront directionality of the more social kind that today we think about what, you know, the SDGs or green transitions, what can be learned from the kind of intra-organizational dynamics that we know were very important, for example, within DARPA when it funded the internet. And this is not about cutting and pasting a DARPA into another country, but it is about actually admitting, like we do with the private sector, that if you're gonna co-create value, if you're gonna take risks, then we actually have to think about organizational dynamics. Um, and, and this is what's interesting, again, breaking it down to public organizations, not just public spending, public investment and organizational cultures that welcome the kind of risk taking that's required to steer an economy in whether it's an ICT revolution, a green revolution, or the investments needed to fight a health pandemic, what does it mean for that organizational capacity? And what I did in the entrepreneurial state was actually look at different types of organizations the National Institutes of Health, which spend 40 billion a year in the US, um, in the United States on health innovation, but also different public banks like the KFW in Germany or in Israel, the public venture capital fund called YASMA, and just ask you know, uh, 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 provocative questions like, had they just uh, de-risked as opposed to taken risks? Had they just regulated, enabled, facilitated the private sector, would we have had the kind of innovations that we know that in fact they were very important for? And you can guess from how I'm saying it that the answer is no. And the other point is to really also break down this notion of public investment that's needed to co-create markets, not just fix them, and to look at it through the entire value chain, the whole innovation chain that's required in any different area. Often we pretend that it's just required upstream and kind of basic research and science, and then you just need to sprinkle in some venture capital funds and somehow commercialization will result. In fact, I hear this all over the world. We have great science, we just don't have enough venture capital. And surprise, surprise, even when the venture capital comes in, still not much happens. And I think the reason that is, is we need to be much more granular and look at the different types of decentralized network of types of public organizations that are required along the whole innovation chain to be co-investing, taking risks alongside the private sector. So not just upstream R&D, but also more downstream applied research and especially institutions that are needed to foster really interesting dynamic conversations and linkages between basic and applied, but also more downstream. This is probably the more controversial point, patient 
long-term committed finance to actually help the few companies that want to innovate, that want to be taking risks. And when I say few, it means it's, you know, because there's lots of risk averseness within the business sector. There's many businesses that in fact don't innovate. So those that do want to innovate require long-term finance. It's not about a short-term exit driven venture capital funding coming in for three or five years. They often need that much longer kind of 10 to 15 year patient finance, which again in the US has been provided, the United States has been provided through the Small Business Innovation Research Program or some others, which have mainly worked through procurement policy and allowed in fact some SMEs to have the time to innovate, to fuel different types of solutions that different departments might require. But really the issue there is time. It takes time and, and there's plenty of finance out there there just often isn't enough patient long-term finance. And again, Yasma in Israel, public fund, InQtel, the CIA's public venture capital fund, but increasingly, and I've been looking at this quite a bit in the green economy space, different types of public banks worldwide, in Europe, the European Investment Bank, having within these public banks, venture capital funds that provide that long-term uh, finance. And even more downstream, right? I'm going down this innovation chain, ambitious procurement policy. This is sort of government as purchaser and as creator of demand. I would argue that we might have not had Moore's law in terms of you know, the, the quick fall in the costs of, of chips had there not been government purchasing <laughs> so many of those and allowing a, you know, learning curve dynamics. But this is basically true in the history. If you look at the history of technological change, had there not been demand pull not just investment push, you wouldn't have had something extremely important, which is not just investment in innovation, but the diffusion and full deployment of existing technology. And one of the ways that my colleague Carlota Perez talks about this, she argues that in the mass production revolution, had there not been a demand side pull occurred, uh, occurring through policies that basically fostered suburbanization, for example, then all those mass produced products, whether it was cars, washing machines, et cetera, wouldn't have had a market. So procurement is extremely important for scaling up, allowing both SMEs, but also other companies to scale up and have a market to serve. So these are just examples of public funds distributed across that whole innovation chain, which have been very important alongside a private initiative. Um, and I already mentioned here the issue of finance, but it's just quite interesting. Now, this is a bit of an old graph. I'm still trying to find something as nice up, uh, up till 2020, but my colleague uh, Fred Block tells me he's, he's, he's building it. What this shows is the difference between uh, early stage uh, VC, uh, VC seed, early stage funding, and different types of public uh, financing. Let's just call it public venture capital fund. And what's interesting is that even in a developed economy like the US, with a developed venture capital market, you still have needed, if anything, it's increased in relevance, this more patient public funding. In fact, what Fred has shown is that uh, successful venture capital money is often on the back of this kind of public funds, which they actually use as a filter to, um, to know which companies actually to invest in because they receive that earlier patient finance from the government. I mentioned uh, renewables and the green transition, which many countries like. Uh, Canada, of course, are interested in. In Canada, this is very important from moving from uh, oil and gas towards a more renewable, if you want, portfolio. What's interesting, if you look at all the different types of public organizations worldwide, which are investing in renewables, there's many different types, right? This comes back to the issue that this isn't about just a big public blob, you know, big brother in any given country, but there's different types of both public and private organizations in any given sector. And yet we know so little about how they work together, both across time and any given time across the risk space. Um, and we used, uh, by we, myself and Gregor Semenyuk, a co-author of mine, have published different works looking at, if you look at the risk space and the capital intensity space and divide it up into four quadrants, what you basically see in the clean tech sector is something we observed in both nanotech, biotech, and the internet, that it's that upper right-hand quadrant, which tends to be the place where, at least in countries which are moving towards uh, 
uh, a green transition where the public actors have played the most important role. There's no point in a public investment to be replacing what the private investment can do, but really creating that additionality, pushing the frontier, um, investing in the higher capital intensity, higher risk, more uncertain spaces. And this is why if you look at different areas, you would find that it's, it's quite normal to under, or how do you say, it, it's quite not surprising to find that you have initially uh, quite a bit of public investment in areas like wind and solar, but once the private sector comes in to those areas, you need less of public money there. Um, I would argue that you still need a lot of public money to be investing in the large uh, capital intensive products, especially, uh, sorry, projects, especially in countries maybe that still are uncertain, either for political or developmental uh, 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 reasons, but in the, in the more new and higher risk and higher uncertain mix of the renewable space like marine energy, R&D, you, you still find a very important role of the public sector. So this is the ideal scenario where the public sector is coming in early stage, more capital intensive in the higher risk area, crowding in the private sector, kind of leading the way not only de-risking them, but actually taking those risks in order to develop uh, those technologies or the diffusion of existing technologies. And all these examples I've just given you, whether we talk about the DARPA investment in the internet, a, a bank like the KFW, which has been very important in Germany in providing that patient finance towards um, its own green transition or public venture capital funds like the Yasma type, that's actually a form of direct investment helping companies actually spend more in areas that otherwise they would be too risk averse to do. And what's interesting with this graph here, um, which is an OECD uh, a graph looking at the direct and indirect government funding and tax support for business R&D, what sometimes is referred as BERD, B-E-R-D, the business spend on research and development as a proportion of GDP, if you break it up into direct and indirect, so kind of money that's provided directly, like a public bank does or the ARPA E form, or the form that's indirect through just like a tax incentive for R&D, countries have very different policy mixes. And you'll see Canada here, I can't point there, but you'll see it somewhere there in the middle. It's the one of the only ones alongside um, another country where you have the, uh, blue po the black point above that blue line. But what you see there with Canada has been an over-reliance historically on the use of indirect incentives, tax incentives. And I personally don't have any problem with tax incentives, but I think that they tend to only work in the area of R&D when it's kind of icing on the cake, when you've already had that direct investment, which actually creates within the business community an expectation of future growth opportunities. And then what the tax incentive does, if it's well uh, designed, there's many badly designed tax incentives. By well designed in this case, I mean, for example, an incentive based on the labor hired to do the R&D, not the profits generated, then it might increase the marginal spend on R&D, but it actually doesn't make R&D happen where it wouldn't have happened anyway. And that's a big problem because if that happens, then basically all you've done is increase the profits of a company. And that's not the job of government to increase profits, but to catalyze investment that otherwise wouldn't have happened because that, for example, would help jobs and also um, transitions. So the reason I set up the institute where um, I'm from or I, I founded the Institute for Innovation and Public Purpose at University College London and why I insisted that the university allow me to set it up as a department a full-fledged department or a teaching program was that I really believe that the lessons from the entrepreneurial state required a new curriculum, a new vocabulary, you know, less about fixing, more about co-creating, less about de-risking, more about welcoming uncertainty, less about leveling, more tilting towards a direction, not micromanaging, not picking one technology, but actually making decisions about directionality, not about picking winners, but picking the willing, a portfolio approach that actually allows um, government through well-designed instruments, which I'll say something about more in a minute, to um, help those companies that are willing to engage in big societal transitions to come along the way and to really support them. Less about outsourcing government capacity to the PWCs and KPMGs and Deloitte's, but investing more in-house in your own knowledge creating mechanisms. Because if you're only there to fix markets, maybe you don't need to be that smart, actually. You just need to know some, you know, where to put the bandages. 
if you're there to co-create and co-shape markets alongside the private sector and co-create value and be a value co-creator, you need a lot of knowledge creation within your own institution. Um, and so, you know, to, to be careful about too much outsourcing uh, from government capacity and less about static cost benefit analysis and more, especially, and again, I'll talk about this more in a second, um, if, if, if you're gonna be mission oriented and really try to solve big societal challenges like those that are underneath the SDGs, you need to also realize that a lot of the interesting th things will happen along the way. So what we often call dynamic spillovers and, and getting a sense of how to capture that and not just the cost benefit static kind of net present value relationships. So what I would like to do in my last eight minutes here is to talk to you a bit, hopefully in an inspiring way, because I personally have <laughs> been spending a lot of time with governments on this around the world, um, on how to implement this, right? Otherwise, it's just philosophy. It's just after dinner talk about, yeah, we need better government, look at the New Deal, yeah, we need to you know, in, invest again, as, as Roosevelt did, and then we just kind of clueless on the how. And so what I, I was quite lucky, I, I, I was asked by the commissioner in the European Commission for a department at the time it was called RTD, Research and Technology, and now it, they've changed their names. I remember basically the Department for Innovation within the European Commission to be a special advisor and to bring some of these lessons to the European uh, Commission in rethinking these big ambitions that they've had for a long time around sustainability and inclusive growth. Um, and because they had heard me talking about missions and mission-oriented organizations, and I had uh, you know, convened uh, some conferences back in 2013 and 14, bringing together that mission-oriented organizations to share this experience that they had uh, about stepping outside that safe box of market fixing. They asked me to write this report, which you see the cover here, and to, and to argue why maybe the European Commission needed to redesign its own policies. And so this concept of missions, which they've now adopted on the back of this report, the idea is that you know, we would have never gone to the moon if we had just stopped with the very broad challenge of the, you know, Sputnik and the space race. It had to be inspirational. There had to be a very targeted, uh, concrete idea of what it is we were trying to achieve. So going to the moon and back again in a generation. And two, it had to be framed in such a way that was broad enough to really uh, crowd in again. I keep using that word because I think it's very important to get away from the dichotomy state and business, but actually the state being ambitious to crowd in business investment across many different sectors. So getting to the moon was not just about NASA and space agencies, but actually a lot of investment and in innovation in sectors as different as nutrition, textiles, um, uh, materials, software, what became the software industry, electronics, and so on. And lots of business innovation and in companies, large companies, and actually some more smaller and medium-sized ones, but the large ones, you'll, you'll know their names, General Electric, Honeywell, Motorola, et cetera. But those little circles there on the bottom are extremely important. That's the experimentation. There was you know, 500, I'm just saying that number, hundreds of different projects that, and kind of homework problems that had to be solved along the way, of which many of them failed, right? So that desire and kind of you know, willingness to take risks was extremely important in the Apollo program. Whereas, you know, uh, I don't know how many of the viewers here uh, work in government, you'll know that when you make a mistake, you're on the front page of the paper <laughs> uh, the next day, you know, being accused of trying to pick winners. But that, that requirement that we know is true in the private sector of taking, you know, trying, uh, trial and error and error and error, learning by doing, that's just as important for any value creating institution, whether it's public or private. And yet that notion of taking risks and being willing to fail is much less common within the uh, public sector because it's, again, been framed as just fixing things and then getting out of the way. So these are just examples, uh, taking it from two particular sustainable development goals around life underwater and climate change. You know, if we just stop there, it'd be very hard to get an investment pathway. So these were just two examples that I gave in the report to explain what I was talking about. So let's just take one of them, um, the climate change, you know, actually having a very focused target in Europe, this was for 100 carbon neutral cities by 2030, reaching net zero greenhouse gas emissions across 100 cities by 2030. You know, this would require investment innovation across a wide array of different sectors from real estate, construction, lumber in Canada, environment, energy, food, mobility, social sector. So intersectoral investments, but especially 
it would require a change in how we currently design grants, loans, procurement, and price schemes to really crowd in those bottom-up solutions you, you have there in the boxes, uh, in the uh, um, circles, the blue circles, just examples of different projects. Um, but you know, the question of how to actually set missions to make sure that they're actually bold, inspirational, and actually mean something to citizens, right? You know, that's difficult. And I do think that around social missions, like a carbon neutral city, which actually requires a lot of behavioral change, that it's so much harder than just a purely technological one, like going to the moon. And actually bringing citizens into that process ex ante, um, so actually, you know, getting citizen assemblies, for example, to even define what is a green transition, what is a carbon neutral city, and in, including, by the way, trade unions, which I think really need to reinvent themselves and to be very proactive in this space, and bringing labor's voice to the table, again, ex ante, not just ex post through a just transition mentality, as important as that is, but as diverse a, a set of different ways to actually set these missions in the first place clear, directed, targeted, I've mentioned, cross-sectoral, cross-actor, and really being able to drive through those bottom-up innovations. These are all, I think, very important pillars of what I personally mean by missions. And in, in a second report I wrote for the commission, these are both reports, by the way, that then we through the Institute started to work with across the globe, often at the city level, and asking these difficult questions like the one I just mentioned, well, who decides the mission? Uh, you know, do we have actually the public sector capabilities to do this? What does it mean for financing and the crowding in dynamics? But also how can you retain a, a, a flexible and adaptable approach throughout? So if things just start to go wrong, you also are able to pivot and question uh, uh, why it is that things are going wrong. So in fact, DARPA is quite well known for having been just as good as turning the tap off as turning it on. Um, let me just move a bit quicker because I have three minutes left. Um, again, on the back of this, the European Commission has actually recently chosen some mission areas. These aren't missions, but areas within which now some mission boards are selecting missions. And you see them here, and you'll see that quite a few have to do with uh, climate um, strategies, whether it's uh, 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 climate change itself, but also the uh, city-specific climate neutral smart city, healthy ocean, soil, health, and food. Um, um, and what something that we did, I think that was quite interesting in the UK, and I, and I do think this is very important for a country like Canada, which is to resist just making a list of sectors, right? So this is work we did with Theresa May's government before Boris Johnson's government currently in power, which is to say, stop having a list of these five sectors. I think at the time they had aerospace, automotive, uh, life sciences, creative industries, um, and financial services, and to actually think of what the problems were in the country. So clean growth, future mobility, an aging society, so the demographic issue, and the whole question of data and the AI economy and how it could interact, for example, with the welfare state. And so I was very proud that we were able to convince them to take this challenge-led approach, and then we set up a commission that I co-chaired with, um, with David Willits, who's a Tory, who's a, a, a lord, uh, around a mission-oriented UK industrial strategy where for all four of those challenges, we help the country think of specific missions, which again, were quite um, intersectoral. This is an example of the 21st century mobility mission, which as you can see there required uh, really thinking through all the different sectors from robotics to health and well-being, financial services, and even just putting the word 100% accessible uh, mobility and transport uh, system means that those circles on the bottom, some of them had to do with those areas that include disabilities. So innovation and investment uh, around disabilities in order to make the public transport and the mobility system 100% uh, accessible. Um, let me just skip ahead. This is just some examples of work we did in Manchester. Uh, this I think is quite important. The HMT Green Book, Her Majesty's Treasury Green Book. I think this is one of the biggest bottlenecks we have, which is if we're going to be ambitious and have public purpose at the center of what we do, be mission oriented. What does it mean for how we evaluate that issue I just mentioned before quickly? So going from a market fixing to a market shaping approach. What does it mean for going beyond these kind of static net present value cost benefit analysis? So we're currently doing a, a project with the treasury. And I do think at least my experience globally is that things aren't that hard to discuss in the Ministry for Innovation or the Environment, and then you get to the Treasury and it's all kind of goes back to square one around some dynamic metrics. Um, again, uh, I'm just going to skip very quickly now. Uh, we also helped in Scotland to set up a mission-oriented public bank uh, 
And I'll just say that in Italy, where I'm from, there's also a public bank, but it's not mission oriented. And historically, it has mainly been just about giving out money to uh, companies that have been uh, uh, facing problems and need to get bailed out. And one of the things I found very interesting in Germany, which we then brought to this conversation in Scotland, was, was when the steel sector in Germany required uh, funds to get bailed out, its public bank, because there was this mission at the macro level around energy then that created conditions attached to that bailout um, around reducing the material composition of steel. So today, Germany, because it was forced in a way to think about that uh, and enacted innovation around repurpose, reuse, and recycle, has one of the most innovative and green steel sectors in the world. Um, I'll just finish by saying, I mean, maybe this is something we can talk about in the Q&A, which is that contracts matter and how to make sure that these public investments aren't just socializing risk, but also rewards is very important. And whether it's this is through public funds or in particular cases, taking equity stakes or golden share of the patents. I mean, these are all different creative ways in which we can think about, you know, if you have a portfolio of investments in order to uh, uh, catalyze the transition, what does it mean for thinking about that risk reward uh, relationship? Let me just stop here because there's other slides and I'll, I'll never shut up and I see that you're trying to come in to tell me to. <laughs> um, but I'm sure we can take on some of these um, uh, other points in the Q&A. Absolutely. Thank you, Mariana. Um, I'm not going to stand in the way of the Q&A because there's a lot of really interesting questions there. Um, so I'd like to welcome Dr. Dan Wicklum, President and CEO of the Transition Accelerator. Dan, over to you. Okay. Uh, Dr. Mazzucato, fantastic presentation, and I'll hit one, head one question off at the past, um, and we've had about 40, I would say, as, as you're chatting here, so I think very well received. Um, the Hunter Center will end up posting a, a, a copy of, a uh, video copy of your presentation, so people will be able to access that. So everyone is answering that question, there's the answer. So, so like if I was just to synthesize your, your presentation, which is, remarkably well researched, remarkably well presented, but it's essentially that, you know, government should have and could have a stronger role in using active tools in terms of investments and markets in shaping what we want our society to look like, right? So let, let, right off the bat, before we get to, to people's questions um, from the attendees, I'll play the devil's advocate role and I'll ask, um, what would you say to people that, that would argue that government does not have the capability? Or, or do you think government actually have the, the, the capacity and capability to, to do this? Because this is fundamentally a role of government question, right? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. And it's actually the question, again, it's, it's why I bothered setting up a whole institute and department, because unfortunately, I think the answer is no, many governments don't have those capabilities, but not because there's anything in the DNA of government that makes it stupid or inertial or less of a good investor than what we have in the private sector, but it's specifically that framing that if you're only there to fix the market, why do you even bother having capabilities that are about kind of that public venture capital portfolio risk reward kind of thinking. And so um, in the Institute, what we've set up is a whole master's in public administration to actually train uh, bureaucrats globally and actually make the word, dare I say bureaucratic, a sexy word. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, it's, it's late here, so I can make jokes. You guys are still uh, in, the, in the afternoon. But you know, it's, it's so interesting that the word bureaucratic is the negative word. Why? Uh, we need bureaucracies. What kind of bureaucracies do we have? If they are static, if they're top down, if they're not flexible, adaptable, if they don't know how to, again, turn the tap off and just kind of stick with uh, what's planned. And if they fear uh, that kind of risk taking, the fear of a problematic type of bureaucracy and you're not going to be developing those capabilities. I should say that there's also been a whole era, and I would say fed by ideology, which has also fed that lack of capacity and capability because of that kind of outsourcing trend, which I briefly mentioned, and I'll sort of won't go into it too long, but I think it's very interesting to see how there's a co-evolution, if you want, of lack of capacity and the, and, and the reliance on outsourcing to consulting companies. I think they themselves have a lot to answer for <laughs> the consulting companies, just this huge presence they have in governments, um, which kind of become addicted to that help and doesn't allow them actually to be better prepared to confront many of the challenges they have. So I'm gonna synthesize a couple of questions into a single one here. And one of the, one of the attendees, I thought used a great phrase and essentially what they said was, what you're talking about is disrupting government. And you know, sure. we tend to think of disruptions as, as, a, as a good thing, creating new markets, creating new products, uh, you know, somehow improving things. 
so you talked about, you know, one, this, this concept of uh, disrupting the government, having them to be more entrepreneurial requires a capacity. And there are ways that you can develop capacity, like, like through the work that you're doing. But what are the other conditions or what else would, would a government need to do in order to create the conditions and, and essentially embark on a pathway to become more innovative, just at a high level? Any, any thoughts? Yeah, I mean, again, I, I think one thing is actually pushing on some new also theoretical pillars because, you know, theory also has an implication on the ground, right? As I mentioned, a lot of, you know, that Keynes quote saying, you know, that the tools that we actually have on the ground, how we design them have actually been informed by theory. So part of what we're trying to do is also push a new theory, public value, public purpose, even define it. So, for example, with the BBC, the um, UK public broadcaster, they've actually talked about public value for a very long time in their history, which has actually then justified the kind of investments they make. That hasn't really been shared across different types of organizations, even just within the UK, let alone globally. So one of the things I also think is very important is to have a sharing platform. This is actually something we host their mission-oriented innovation network between organizations like Yasma. What worked? What doesn't? You know, didn't. Uh, between different public banks, what happens when you are really just kind of, you know, a handout machine and aren't actually creating those conditionalities like in the case that I just gave at the end with the German public bank, which then fosters a much more symbiotic, less parasitic kind of public-private partnership. So one thing is just to admit that this is hard and we need platforms where public organizations globally learn what it actually means to step outside that narrow box. But then, you know, just to get really specific, it's not about putting, you know, just government in the position of having pet projects like, oh, we're going to do offshore wind or, or fusion. It is about always thinking that this is about thinking of broad directions. And I do think the SDGs are the ones that we need to be thinking about. And within those, thinking about these really concrete kind of goals, but within that, a portfolio approach. So if, you know, and if you're gonna have a portfolio approach, so you know, investing in different types of renewables so you don't put all your eggs in one basket, that itself requires a particular type of capability to think about how to distribute the risk across that portfolio. So, but how you think of risk and reward will be defined differently. So when I mentioned at the end there that we need to also be socializing, rewards, not just risks, um, you know, that's not just about monetary reward, that is about conditions. So how do we govern, for example, intellectual property rights so that they're not abused in an area like health innovation, extremely relevant right now with COVID. If you look at what's happening both with the therapies for COVID, the drug called remdesivir, I can't pronounce it, and the vaccine, this isn't just about a race for a vaccine. If we want it to be universal, and accessible by everyone, that's gonna have a particular type of governance structure. So thinking about the common good and the public good requires a way to govern the innovation process itself. And you'll know that patents have historically been quite abused, they're often too wide, they're too strong, so hard to license, they're too upstream. All these things are often result of bad deals that the government itself is striking and my experience is that there, it's, it's often a result of being not very confident <laughs> of your role. So this issue of also changing the narrative, those, those words that I had up here, this is from our brochure, which, you know, these words that we cross out, that's a, like a different storytelling. You know, Plato said storytellers rule the world. Uh, the story we tell about what government is actually will affect also its confidence when it's striking a deal. And I often say it's not just about the green deal, it's the deal. Like, we know more about the green bit, this, listen to the science, as Greta says, the deal is really messy because governments have often accepted this very siloed notion of what they are and then struck very problematic deals because it's not, uh, uh, how do you say, too equal. Uh, um, anyway, uh, there's power relationships that have to do with the theory itself of how it's described. Right. So we're having this conversation, you know, in this event at a remarkably pertinent time. So you may not know tomorrow um, is our government of Canada's uh, speech from the throne, where the federal government will essentially announce its vision for its future government. It will attach confidence votes to that. So we may actually be going into an election. And the liberals have been very uh, deliberately cultivating um, I would say the receiving environment for that throne and, and priming people for it to be a very big uh, financial announcements or a suite of announcements that aligns with this concept of building back better, building back more just and more, more green and so on. So, you know, it, it is remarkable timing. Uh, so this concept of government as entrepreneur, do you think it's getting easier or less easy 
mm. considering global trends. So I'm thinking of things like, uh, well, certainly we have COVID and, and you know, every country is asking for massive government intervention. Um, but I think even before that, you know, we were, we were backing off of globalization for many different reasons. Um, I'm thinking about trends in politics where, where politicians communicate directly with the electorate by Twitter. So do you think it's getting easier or less easy um, in, our, in our current political dynamic and our current global state for governments to, to develop and be more innovative? So, you know, again, I, I think it's, it's a fascinating question, a really important question, but there's no one answer because it depends. And, I, and I've actually written quite a bit about this um, during COVID. It's, I've been fascinated um, by how differently countries have reacted in terms of how the funds have come into the economy. So Macron, for example, has you know, said very clearly in France that the government's role was not just to save the airlines <clears throat> or to save the automotive sector, but precisely because they were the most polluting sectors. And again, remember all the conversations in January and February before the March lockdowns was about you know, the fires in California and Australia, the floods in, in Venice. So there was all this talk about the Green Deal. So he said, we need to take this opportunity to transform, not just save industry. And he created strong conditions for Renault and Air France, for example, in terms of conditionality on the bailouts received. Denmark created the conditionalities around uh, you know, companies that had been overly using or just using tax havens. So extracting value as opposed to you know, reinvesting it back into the economy, very important for public services, et cetera, wouldn't be eligible for the bailouts. In other countries, including in the UK, we gave a, you know, a massive bailout to EasyJet, no conditions attached. So all of these things, require agency. There's nothing, again, deterministic about, you know, a crisis and what's going to happen with the public sector. We definitely failed after the financial crisis, you know, trillions poured in, most of that money ended up back in the financial sector and finance, insurance, real estate. Um, but that was also because it wasn't accompanied by equally ambitious kind of fiscal stimulus packages, which had to do with new structures, um, and, and systems within the real economy. So I think what COVID presents us is such tangible problems in the real economy from the digital divide to the health pandemic that we absolutely need to make sure that this money that's pouring in both has these kind of conditionalities I, that I talked about, but also actually finds its way into creating a stronger system, especially, but not only health systems in the real economy, but that doesn't happen on its own. That is precisely what requires that directionality that I began. Uh, talking about in the beginning. Um, and, and that kind of leads me to that second part of your question, which is, you know, uh, you know, I mean, I, we can talk about social media, but let's talk about it more in terms of engagement, right? You know, are governments able to engage the you know, citizenry and how are its messages, you know, is there trust? Um, and we know with the vaccine itself, there's issues of trust and, and, and with the testing process, there's issues of trust. Um, and I do think one of the really interesting things around this notion of the mission-oriented approach is that slide where I had who decides. And the reason I'm so interested in working with cities, and I recently gave a talk to 40 mayors through the C40 network, is cities have such tangible you know, problems going from point A to point B, and it's not necessarily the case. You always want to go there quicker. Your experience along the way has to kind of fulfill all sorts of different experiential processes you might have, but who's better to decide that than the citizens themselves living in a city. So I think what we really need to invest in is new social innovations around things like citizen assemblies, which actually bring new voices to the table, unlike the top down, say Apollo project, new voices to the table, whether it's student movements, I mentioned workers movements, the green movement, citizens, or if we're thinking about, you know, COVID, uh, people working in the caring industry, bringing those voices to the table to set these really ambitious societal challenges and, and transforming them into concrete goals that then policy tackles, but it cannot be a pet project of a minister or an academic who flies in to Canada and tells you what your problems are. Right. So it's interesting. It strikes me that a, a, a person's opinion or, or a company's opinion, a group's opinion on the role of government would map in this country, at least pretty closely to where they map out on the political spectrum, uh, left or right. Um, <laughs> And you know, to, to riff on that a little bit, um, just picking up on your last comment there about different types of innovation. So you've got, uh, you, you talked about social innovation. And one of, I think, the reasons why we launched this new organization that I'm working for now is that you, you know, we're of the opinion that we have invest, 
umpteen billions of dollars in technology innovation, you know, tech dev uh, for a long time, but relatively little in social innovation and relatively little, frankly, in innovating around creating, creating new markets, not finding right. markets for, yeah. for, for products or services, but fundamentally creating new markets. And that's what we're doing. We're actually trying to create a market for hydrogen, which then Alberta uh, and other parts of the country could, uh, uh, could then fill. But, um, but, but let me sort of wrap this into a, a, a bow and ask you, what countries do you think do a good job of what you're talking about and why? Yeah, I mean, I always hesitate answering the question in a kind of way of just naming the country. I tend to look more at examples within countries that I've learned from. So uh, one thing that I found so interesting in the UK, which has otherwise had you know, a long era of actually disinvesting in some ways from the state from Thatcher onwards is that there's been some pockets of really cool things. So in recent years, um, there was a government digital services was set up to actually set up a government website, which if you think about it, it's quite interesting because you know, to uh, communicate a white paper or a green paper, most people will go say to Google and you know, get that white paper. So the government was like, why don't we have our own kind of you know, platform? And initially they thought, oh, but we're stupid. We'll just outsource it, right? To, to, to Circo in, in particular, one, um, one of the companies that gets a lot of the uh, public contracts, they did a terrible job. And then it was actually a group in the BBC Again, a public organization that has often been very ambitious with these intra-organizational debates about public value, they had invested in the iPlayer, which is a very innovative platform for all the BBC broadcasting, radio, and TV. And that team went into the cabinet office and set up what later became gov.uk under this GDS head, Government Digital Services. And the first thing they did, the first thing they did was question, who are we serving? And they said, the citizen is not a customer. It's not a client, you know, all that clientization of citizens, students are clients of schools, patients are customers of, of hospitals. They said they're users. And this isn't exactly a romantic poetic word, right? But just the fact that you're focusing on the citizen, their user experience when they're getting their passport, their driver's license, their voting uh, cards, and trying to enhance their experience with the welfare state itself, but also creating a platform that allows interdepartmental communication between departments, because we know departments and government often work in very siloed ways, that kind of project of a government website had you know, all sorts of really ambitious uh, targets like that. Again, fostering interdepartmental coordination and, and enhancing the user experience of the citizen in, in, in their interaction with the welfare state. And that itself I thought was fascinating. Um, I do think that those countries that have invested in public uh, funds like of the YASMA type or in the public banks type, I think it's been very interesting to see where those investments have again created that interesting conditionality or reward mechanisms. So in Israel, it was done through royalties. In some countries, it's done through equity stakes. I've often argued that the US government might have invested a lot, but they've kind of screwed up on the, on the rewards bit. So if you think about the Tesla and the Solyndra investment, Solyndra failed, everyone knows about it. They said, you know, another example of government failing and its investment the same amount of money, close to 500 million in a guaranteed loan went to Tesla, but they didn't structure it like a portfolio. And had they retained some of the equity in the investment that they made in Tesla, um, they would have more than been able to pay off the Solyndra loss in the next round, instead of just being you know, bashed for um, having created a failing uh, institution. Instead, what Obama did, which I just think is so telling, because I do think we need to learn from the mistakes, not just the successes, he actually said to Elon Musk, if you don't pay back the loan, we get uh, 3 million shares in your company, Wh which is foolish. Why would you want 3 million shares in you know, a company that doesn't pay back the loan because it's failing? Had he said, we get 3 million shares if you're successful and pay back the loan, which they did, the price per share went from 9 to 90. Multiply that by 3 million, again, seen as an investment portfolio, it would have helped it, you know, not only have more funds for the next investments, but also it's communication with the citizens, getting citizens to see themselves, not just as lenders of last resort, but investors of first resort, I think it's fascinating. And that does go to the narrative question. Um, so even though in theory, you can create money, you know, the whole MMT debate, I don't know how much that's talked about in Canada. Um, in practice, the, the politics of it, I think it is very important that government think about different ways to share in those rewards. And that's why I'm sort of a, more of a fan of the concept of a citizen's dividend than universal basic income. It might end up being the same amount that's given out, but the concept of UBI, I think it's too passive. 
It's like, you know, wealth is created here and then handed out over there. Whereas this much more active concept of a citizen's dividend, which can come you know, through a, a public wealth fund where the fund itself is replenished by value and it's co-created by the state and then you know, given to citizens through their share. I just think it, it's, it's a more honest <laughs> uh, and active and dynamic portrayal of what we need with an entrepreneurial state and citizenry as part of that process. You know, inherent in a lot of your thinking and a lot of your answers here is that concept of risk. Mm. So, you know, the whole idea of creating a portfolio of projects, whether you're a company or whether you're uh, a government investor, is, is you want to uh, be fairly guaranteed that you're going to have some successes and that will allow you to put up with uh, some losses. And I think it's even more appropriate to think in terms of risk when you're a country like Canada. And this is one of the questions in, uh, here is, you're actually a pretty small country like Canada uh, in everything. We have some inherent advantages like geographic location to markets and, and natural resources and so on. But at the end of the day, we're not going to be able to compete on everything all the time with big countries that just could do more things like the countries that, that we know about. So um, to me, it strikes me that inherently this is about a risk, a risk perception, tolerance and management type of uh, issue. And, um, but I think it's about making choices like you can't do everything, but you will have to make choices. So Denmark, tiny country, tiny, tiny, tiny country, hardly larger than the greater London area, is the number one provider today to, uh, of high tech green services to China's green economy. And China's spending 1.7 trillion in greening its whole manufacturing base, including energy friendly technologies, not just renewable energy. And, and Denmark is servicing it through its high tech services. Um, I just think that's fascinating. And that's because they actually made choices at the city level. Again, you know, Copenhagen becoming a green carbon neutral city, at least its plans around that, created a whole funky startup scene. It wasn't startups just for the sake of being startups, so this obsession with startups and SMEs, but it was startups that were able to scale up through, again, these kind of, you know, government missions at the city level, et cetera. And I think that's definitely something that, you know, a country as big as Canada compared to Denmark uh, can do, but that does beg the question, what are the priorities regionally in Canada, at the city level, at the regional level, and how they can be used as scaling up funnels through, for example, government procurement? Yeah, it's interesting. And if I just sort of play on that uh, a little bit, you know, Canada's got a great country, lots of advantages, but one of the things that we have to struggle with is that we have remarkable, probably as much regional diversity as any country in the world when you go coast to coast. And we have three levels of government with an indigenous government as well. So essentially four levels of government. So that whole concept of setting priorities uh, has been you know, taken over by a narrative of governments can't and therefore shouldn't pick winners and losers. Um, and I think it's very complicated in terms of, of government, especially the federal government's role in trying to keep the nation together in terms of their ability to pick, to, to set priorities, which but even if you're deregulating, you're picking, you know what I mean? Like that whole thing about picking, we just need to stop. Like we just need to say, what are the choices you're making? And again, deregulation was a choice. Uh, you know what I mean? So it's, 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 it's this false myth that somehow it's either picking or just kind of stepping back. You're never stepping back. Stepping back itself is a choice which will make the economy go in a particular direction. And that's why I began with that whole issue and the word directionality, because once you confront it and embrace it, you're then forced to talk about it. Like we almost need therapy around this. <laughs> and to, uh, well, yeah, we can end on that. We need therapy. Yeah. We'll leave, we'll leave on, the, on the call for therapy. Maybe Canada should go sit on uh, Mariana's couch for a while. Right? Big couch, big couch. Um, yeah. Or you can babysit my kids and I'll come to you. <laughs> Another Fair deal. I want to thank Mariana and Dan. I wish we had more time to unpack this. It's been fantastic. And as part one of our event comes to an end, I want to revisit our poll question. And I'll tell you a little bit about how we did the first round. So we ended up with about 71% of the participants agreeing or strongly agreeing with the question of whether they're comfortable with a competent government being an active risk taker in pursuit of economic growth, even when initiatives fail sometimes. So I invite you all to vote again, and we'll see if we push the needle. In the meantime, I'd like to just bring up that we'll have part two of our session on October 1st. It'll be an expert panel discussion on these topics with Jim DeWald, the Dean of the Haskane School of Business, Carol Ann Hilton, the CEO of the Indigenomics Institute, Marcia Nelson, board member of Alberta Blue Cross, 
and Jason Ribeiro, Director of Strategy from Calgary Economic Development. And in, it looks like we pushed the needle up to 81% of people that strongly <laughs> agree or agree with the question at hand. So well done, Mariana. Yeah, and, but you began uh, on a very good platform. <laughs> You're less dysfunctional. You need less therapy. <laughs> oh, good. We'll save some money somewhere. We'll still go for it, though. Take advantage of it. So I also just want to take a moment to thank the teams from the Haskin School of Business and the School of Public Policy, whose hard work made this whole event possible. And I want to thank you, our community, uh, for joining us in this strategic conversation. You've chosen to spend your time with us, and we really appreciate it. Again, thank you to our moderator, Dan, and to our special guest, Mariana Mazzucato. See you on October 1st. Thank you. Goodbye.